Mrs. Colombo sipped from her cup of black coffee and watched Sonny warily as he finished off another of her sugar cookies and chattered about those two boys from the neighborhood, Johnny Fontaine and Nino Valenti, going on about how Johnny was a great singer and Nino could play the mandolin like an angel. Occasionally, she nodded or grunted, but mostly, she seemed alternatingly bored and suspicious as she sipped her coffee and looked out the rain-streaked kitchen window of her apartment, which was small and cramped and full of the sugary sweet smell of baking cookies. Sandra, who held a glass of water in both hands across the kitchen table from Sonny, hadn't spoken a dozen words in the past half hour while Sonny talked to her grandmother, who now and then slipped in a few sentences of her own. Mrs. Colombo, Sonny said, and then paused as he placed his cup down on the table and crossed his arms over his chest, announcing that he was about to say something of significance. How come you don't trust a good Italian boy like me? What? Mrs. Colombo appeared to be taken aback by the abrupt shift in conversation. She looked to the bowl of twist cookies in the center of the table, as if something about her baking might be the cause of Sonny's question. I would like to take your granddaughter out to dinner tonight, where Johnny and Nino are performing. Sandra feels that this is out of the question, that you would never allow me to take her out to dinner. And so I ask, respectfully, why is it you don't trust a good Italian boy like me, someone whose family you know and count among your friends? Ah! Mrs. Colombo slapped her cup down, sloshing a wave of coffee over the brim and onto the table. She looked as though she was more than willing to have this discussion with Sonny. You ask me why I don't trust a good Italian boy like you? She waved a single outstretched finger at Sonny's nose. Because I know all about the men, Santino Corleone. I know what men want she said, spitting out the words and leaning over the table. Especially young men, but eh, all of you. You're all the same. And Sandra and me, we have no good family man to protect us. Mrs. Colombo. Sonny cocked his head, suggesting that he took her point and understood her concern. He reached for one of the delicious twists of golden dough in the center of the table. All I want, he said, placing the cookie on a plate next to his cup, his voice eminently reasonable, is to take Sandra out to a supper club so she can hear Johnny and Nino. They're local boys. You know them. It's a very fancy place, Mrs. Colombo. Why do you want to go out to dinner? Mrs. Colombo asked. Our house is not good enough for you. You get better food here than some fancy restaurant, and it doesn't cost you your hard-earned money. That I don't argue, Sonny said. No restaurant can equal your cooking. So, Mrs. Colombo turned to look at Sandra for the first time, as if she had just remembered she was at the table and she wanted her support. Why does he want to spend his money at some restaurant? She asked Sandra. Sandra looked to Sonny. Listen, Mrs. Colombo. Sonny's face paled as he reached into his pants pocket and pulled out a small package that he kept hidden in his closed fist. This is for your Sandra, he said, opening his hand, revealing a small black box. I planned on surprising her with it tonight at dinner, but since we can't have that dinner until we have your approval, he moved the box closer to Mrs. Colombo without looking at Sandra, who had covered her mouth with her hands. What is this foolishness? Mrs. Colombo snatched the box out of Sonny's hand and opened it to reveal a diamond ring. This is our engagement ring. Sonny looked across the table at Sandra. Sandra and me are getting married, he said. When Sandra nodded eagerly at him, a smile blossomed on his face and he added dramatically, looking at Mrs. Colombo, but only if you let me take her out to hear Johnny and Nino, where I can propose the... Ettore Barzini followed Giuseppe as he inspected the roof, holding an umbrella over his head while Tits did the same for Emilio. The rest of the boys were still downstairs in the empty apartment, where someone had brought in sandwiches and a case of Coca-Cola. Giuseppe walked to the edge of the roof and looked down over the ledge to the street. Crowds of pedestrians hurried along the avenue, hidden under the multicolored circles of their umbrellas. The rain was light but steady, and an occasional pale flash of distant lightning showed through the clouds, followed by a low rumble of thunder. Giuseppe pointed to the black loops of a fire escape ladder. To Emilio, he said, Have your boys loosen the bolts, make sure no one could climb up from the street. Sure, Emilio said. A gust of wind ruffled his hair. 
With the palm of his hand, he pushed back a few loose strands that had fallen over his forehead. Tell you the truth, Joe, he said. We take care of Clemenza and Jenko tonight. I think Vito comes to us tomorrow with his tail between his legs. Giuseppe pulled his jacket tight and turned his back to the wind. At each corner of the roof, the hunched shape of a gargoyle peered down over the city streets. He was silent a moment, thinking, and then he said, I'd like to see that. Vito Corleone coming to me with his tail between his legs. You know what I'd do? He asked, perking up. I'd kill him anyway. But first I'd let him try some of his big talk on me. He smiled, his eyes bright. Oh, yeah? he said, mimicking talking to Vito. Oh, really? That's interesting, Vito. He raised his hand as if holding a gun and pointed it at Emilio's head. Pop! I'd blow his brains all over the wall. I'd tell him that's how I talk, Vito. What do you think of that? He looked to Tits and Atori as if he had just remembered that they were there, and now he wanted their response. Both young men smiled as if they had immensely enjoyed his story. Emilio didn't smile. He's a smart guy, Vito Corleone, he said. I don't like him either, Joe, but he's not all talk. What I'm saying? We take care of Clemens and Jenko, he's crippled, and he'll be the first to know it. He paused and moved closer to Tits. He yanked the kid's hand down a few inches, bringing the umbrella closer. He'll be the first to know he's crippled, Emilio repeated. And then, I think, he'll give us what we want. His only other choice will be a war that he knows he'll lose. And he's not a hothead. He's not crazy. We can bank on him doing what's best for him and his family. A lightning flash brighter than the others lit up the dark clouds for an instant. Giuseppe waited for the thunder, which came several seconds later, a muted, distant boom. So I don't push him right away, you're saying? I don't think he'll give you the chance. Emilio put his arm around Giuseppe's shoulders and guided him back to the roof door as the rain started to come down harder. Vito's not stupid, he continued, but soon enough. He opened his hand in front of him, a gesture that suggested he was showing Mariposa the future. We make sure he keeps getting weaker, and then, then we take care of him. Only thing that worries me, Giuseppe said, is Luca Brazzi. I don't like it. Tits opened the roof door and stepped aside. I don't like it either, Emilio said, waiting alongside Tits. But what can you do? We have to take care of Luca. We'll take care of him. Tommy wants to rip Brazzi's heart out, Giuseppe said, and he stepped out of the rain and into a well-lit area at the head of a flight of stairs. What about Vito's boy, Sonny? Giuseppe asked Emilio. Is he a problem? Sonny, Emilio said. He's a bambino. But probably when we get to Vito, we'll have to take care of him too. Too many sons in this business, Joe said, thinking of the Lacantis. At the top of the stairs, he stopped and watched Tits pull the roof door closed and lock it with a key that Emilio handed to him. Did you make sure about the newspaper guys? He asked Emilio. They'll be at the club with the photographers. Good. It's always smart to have an alibi. Giuseppe started down the stairs and then turned around again. You reserved us a table by the stage, right? Joe, we got it all taken care of. Emilio joined Giuseppe on the stairs, put his hand on the back of his arm, and guided him down the steps. What about Frankie? He asked. He should be there with us. Giuseppe shook his head. I don't trust him. I don't want him to know anything more than he has to know. Say, Joe. Emilio said. Is Frankie with us or not? I don't know, Giuseppe said. Let's see how things go. At the bottom of the flight of stairs, Carmine Rosado waited. You trust these two guys, the two Anthonys? Joe asked Emilio. They're good, Emilio said. I've used them before. I don't know. Giuseppe stopped at the bottom of the flight and stood beside Carmine. These Cleveland guys, he said. They're buffoons, Forlenza and all the rest of them. They've gotten the job done for me before, Emilio said. They're good boys. And we're sure Clemenza and Jenko will be there. Out of the building, Tits scanned the street for parked cars. He saw Emilio's and walked toward it and then passed it to the corner of 24th, where he again scanned both sides of the street. 
In the middle of the block, toward 6th Avenue, he spotted Frankie's black DeSoto and approached it casually, glancing back now and then over his shoulder. When he reached the car, he bent down to the street side window, which was open. Get in, Frankie said. I've been watching the street. It's okay. The kid got in the car and then slouched down so that his knees were up on the dashboard and his head was hidden by the seat back. Frankie Patangeli looked down at Tits and laughed. I told you, he said. There's nobody out here. I don't want to have to explain to anybody what I was doing in your car. What are you doing in my car? Frankie asked, still amused at the sight of Tits scrunched up in a ball. What do you got for me? It's tonight, Tits said. Emilio brought in the two Anthonys from Cleveland. Anthony Bocatelli and Anthony Forenza, Frankie said, all the amusement rapidly going out of him. You sure no one else? Just for you and Zana, Tit said. He's the driver. Everybody else will be at the store club getting their pictures taken. Everybody but me, Frankie said. He took an envelope out of his jacket pocket and handed it to Tits. Tits pushed the envelope away. I don't want money, he said. Makes me feel like a Judas. Kid, Frankie said, meaning he should take the money. Just don't forget me, Tits said. If somehow you come out on top in all this, he looked up at Frankie. I hate jumping Joe, el bastardo. You and everybody else, Frankie said, and he put the envelope back in his pocket. I won't forget, he added. Meanwhile, keep your mouth shut. On the stage, which was a platform at the back of a long, narrow room that resembled a railroad car, Johnny leaned over a mic he held in his left hand and sang a particularly moody version of I Cover the Waterfront. His right hand opened at his waist, palm turned out to the crowd, as if imploring them to listen. For the most part, the dozens of patrons ignored him as they ate meals at tables so crammed into the available space that the waiters had to turn sideways as they navigated the maze with trays of food held high over their heads. Some of the women, though, were watching and listening, and they all seemed to share the same absorbed, wistful expression while they turned sideways in their seats, their eyes on the skinny, bow-tied singer, while their boyfriends or husbands went about digging into their food and drinking their wine or liquor. There was no possible room to dance. Even a trip to the restrooms involved a delicate ballet of twists and turns. Still, the place, as Johnny had promised, was swanky. The women were dressed in gowns and pearls and glittery diamond jewelry, and the men looked like bankers and politicians in tailored suits and patent leather shoes that caught the light and glistened when they crossed the room. He sings beautifully, don't you think? Sandra asked. She held her wine glass by the stem with her right hand while her left hand rested only slightly awkwardly on her knee. She had on the dress Sonny had bought for her, a long lavender gown, tight around her waist and thighs, and billowing out over her calves where it swept the floor when she walked. Nothing's as beautiful as you tonight, Sonny said, and then smiled to see that he had made her blush yet again. He sipped his whiskey and his eyes dropped to Sandra's breasts, which were covered entirely by a high neckline, but were revealed still by the way the silky fabric clung to them. What are you looking at? Sandra asked and then Sonny blushed embarrassed before he caught himself and laughed at her boldness. You're full of surprises, he said. I didn't know that about you. Well, that's good, isn't it? Sandra said. A girl should surprise her guy now and then. Sonny propped his head on his hands and grinned as he looked at Sandra appraisingly. That sales girl who helped me pick out your dress, he said. She knew her stuff. Sandra let go of her wine glass and reached across the table to take Sonny's hand. I'm so happy, Santino, she said, and gazed up at him. When the silence felt a little awkward, Sonny looked across the room to the stage. He's a little crazy, that Johnny, he said. My father got him a good job as a riveter in the shipyards, but he wants to be a singer. Sonny made a face that said he didn't understand Johnny. He's got some voice, though, huh? When Sandra only nodded, he added, his mother's a pip, mud on. What about his mother? Sandra asked. She lifted the wine glass to her lips and took a healthy sip. Nothing really, Sonny said. She's a little nutty, that's all. I guess that's where Johnny gets it from. His father's a fire chief, he said. Good friend of the family. Sandra listened as Johnny finished up the song accompanied by Nino. They look like good boys, she said. 
That's swell, Sonny said. Tell me about Sicily, he added. What was it like growing up there? A lot of my family, she said. They died in the earthquake. Oh, Sonny said. I didn't know. I'm sorry. It was before I was born, she said, as if to excuse Sonny from having to feel bad for her. My relatives that survived, they all left Messina and came to America. And then some of them later, they went back to Messina and started up their lives again. So, for me, I'm from Sicily, true. But I grew up hearing about the wonderful America. About what a great country, America. So why'd they go back? I don't know, Sandra said. Sicily's beautiful, she added after thinking about it. I miss the beaches and the mountains, especially Lipari, where we used to go for vacations. How come I never hear you speak in Italian? Sonny asked, even with your grandmother. I grew up, my parents talked English around me, my relatives talked English. They sent me to school to improve my English. I speak English better than I speak Italian. Sonny laughed at that, and an echoing burst of laughter came from the back of the room, from the tables surrounding the stage where Nino was goofing around with Johnny. The food, Sandra whispered as if to warn Sonny of their waiter's approach. A tall, handsome, middle-aged man who spoke with a French accent appeared alongside the table. He placed two covered dishes in front of them and dramatically announced the meals as he removed each silver-plated cover. Chicken cordon bleu, he said to Sandra. And the pewter house steak rare for these gentlemen, he said, though it sounded more like pewter house steak to Sonny's ear. When he was finished, the waiter hesitated, as if to see if the diners had any requests. When neither spoke, he bowed briskly from the waist and left. Did he think we forgot what we ordered? Sonny asked, and he mimicked the waiter's accent. Pewter ho steak. Look, Sandra said, and she turned toward the back of the room where Johnny had just stepped off the stage to polite applause and was making his way to their table. Sonny stood to greet Johnny. They embraced, slapping each other on the back. Oh, Johnny said, glancing at the bloody steak on Sonny's plate. You sure that thing's dead? Johnny. Sonny said, ignoring the joke. I'm waiting to meet my future wife, he gestured to Sandra. Johnny took a step back and looked at Sonny as if waiting for a punchline. You're on the level, he asked. And then he looked down at the table as Sandra placed her hand on the tablecloth beside her plate, displaying the diamond on her finger. Well, will you look at that, he said, and he shook Sonny's hand. Congratulations, Santino. He extended his hand to Sandra. When she took his awkwardly, without getting up from her seat, he bent to her, lifted her hand, and kissed it. We're family now, he said. Sonny's father's my godfather. I hope you'll think of me like a brother. Yeah, a brother, Sonny said, and he shoved Johnny. To Sandra, he said, you gotta watch this guy. And of course, I'll be singing at your wedding, he said to Sandra. To Sonny, he said, and I won't even charge you too much. Where's Nino? Sonny asked. Ah, he's mad at me again. What'd you do? Nothing. He's always getting mad at me about something. Johnny shrugged as if at Angelo's, the waiter had just delivered a covered tray to the table where Clemenza and Jenko were talking casually to each other, a squat, straw-wrapped bottle of Chianti between them on a red tablecloth. Jenko's elbows rested on either side of his plate, his hands pressed together palm to palm in front of his face, his two index fingers squeezing the tip of his nose. He nodded now and then as he listened to Clemenza, who was doing most of the talking. They both looked to be absorbed in their conversation, and neither of them seemed interested in the tray that had just been delivered. The restaurant was tiny, with only six tables, all of them close together. Clemenza's back was to the kitchen, near a set of leather and case swinging doors with porthole windows, through which Jenko could see Angelo at his stove beside a stainless steel counter. The four other diners in the room were at tables across from each other, against opposite walls, making a small triangle, their two tables at the base, and Clemenza and Jenko at the tip. The place was quiet, filled only with the muted sounds of three conversations and the occasional clatter of pots and pans from the kitchen. To enter Angelo's from the street, the two Anthonys had to climb down three steps and pull open a heavy door, with the name of the restaurant on a brass plate under a small rectangular window. That brass plate was the only indication there was a restaurant in a place that otherwise looked like a basement apartment, no windows looking out onto the street, 
only a red brick wall and those three steps to a heavy wooden door. Anthony Forenza glanced back to the black Chrysler four-door parked on the street in front of the restaurant, Fio and Zana, a kid with peach fuzz on his face, at the wheel. The kid looked like he couldn't be more than 16. Forenza didn't like having a bambino as his wheelman. It made him nervous. Beside him at the door, Bocatelli, the other Anthony, peered into the restaurant through a clouded pane of glass. He was the bigger of the two Anthonys, though in stature and age they were roughly the same, both pushing 50, both a little over 5'10". They'd known each other since they were boys growing up on the same block in Cleveland Heights. They'd started getting in trouble together as teenagers, and by the time they were in their 20s, they were known by everybody as the two Anthonys. Bocatelli shrugged and said, I can't see much. You ready? Forenza looked through the window. He could make out the rough outline of a few tables. Only looks like a few people in there, he said. We shouldn't have any trouble spotting them. But you know them, right? Bocatelli said. Been a few years, but yeah, I know Pete, he said. You ready? The Anthonys were both wearing black trench coats over snappy three-piece suits with white tab collars and gold collar bars, matching bright white carnations pinned to their lapels. Under Forenza's trench coat, a double-barreled, sawed-off shotgun was holstered at his waist. Bocatelli was lightly armed in comparison, with a Colt forty-five in his pocket. Forenza said, I kind of like Pete. He's a funny guy. We'll send him a nice wreath, Bocatelli said. The family will appreciate it. Forenza took a step back, and Bocatelli opened the door for him. Clemenza recognized him right away, and Forenza acted surprised at seeing him. Hey, Pete, he said. He started to pull open his trench coat, Bocatelli coming up alongside him as they approached Clemenza's table. Jenko twisted around in his chair just as Bocatelli reached into his pocket. And then the kitchen doors swung open, and a monster of a man stepped through them, his arms dangling at his sides, his face twisted grotesquely. The guy was tall enough that he had to stoop as he passed through the doors. He took a few steps into the room and stood at ease behind Clemenza. Forenza had already reached under his trench coat, about to pull the shotgun from its holster, and Bocatelli alongside him had his hand in his coat pocket. But both men froze at the sight of that bestia coming through the kitchen doors. Luca and the two Anthonys stared at each other over the heads of Pete and Jenko, everyone frozen in place, until two gunshots from the streets broke the tableau. Bocatelli turned his head slightly, as if he had considered looking behind him in the direction of the gunshots, before he jumped mimicking the movement of Forenza beside him, Bocatelli bringing the colt out of his pocket and Forenza pulling out the shotgun. They appeared to have been confused by the huge unarmed man at the table behind Clemenza before they realized what was going on and went for their weapons, and by that time, it was too late. The four men slightly in front of them at the wall tables already had their guns in hand. They lifted them from under red cloth napkins and fired a dozen shots, seemingly all at once. Clemenza lifted a glass of wine to his lips. Two of his men came out of the kitchen once the shooting was over, one of them carrying sheets of plastic, the other with a wash bucket and mop. And a minute later, the two Anthonys were being hauled through the kitchen door and out of sight. All that was left behind were slick wet spots where their blood had been cleaned up. Richie Gatto and Eddie Veltri, two of the four who had done the shooting, approached Clemenza as Luca Brazzi without a word followed the others and disappeared through the kitchen. Put the bodies in the car with the driver and take them down to the river, Clemenza said. Richie looked through the portholes as if to assure himself no one was listening. That Brazzi's got some balls, he said to Clemenza. No gun, no nothing. He just stood there. Jenko said to Clemenza, Did you see the Anthony stop in their tracks soon as he came through the door? Clemenza acted unimpressed. To Richie and Eddie, he said, Andate. And as they started to leave, he twisted in his seat and called into the kitchen. Frankie, what are you doing back there? If I squint my eyes, Sandra said, it's like we're flying. She leaned against the door and looked out the car window as the upper stories of apartment buildings rushed by, most of the windows brightly lit sometimes with a quick blur of people going about their private lives, oblivious to the traffic sailing past them. 
Sonny had taken the West Side Highway out of the city and was about to exit on the way back to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx. They used to call this Death Avenue, he said, before they elevated it like this. When all the traffic was down on the street with the trains, they'd crash all the time, the trains and the cars. Sandra appeared not to hear him. Then she said, I don't want to think about crashes tonight, Sonny. Tonight is like a dream. She squinted her eyes and looked out the window to the buildings and the skyline. When Sonny took the exit ramp and descended to the street, she sat up, slid across the seat, and rested her head on his shoulder. I love you, Santino, she said. I'm so happy. Sonny shifted into second gear and put his arm around her. When she nuzzled closer to him, he pulled the Packard over to the curb, cut the engine, and wrapped her up in his arms, kissing her and letting his hands wander over her body for the first time. When he held her breasts and she didn't resist, when she instead made a sound like a cat purring and ran her fingers through his hair, he pulled away from her and started the car. What is it? Sandra asked. Sonny. Sonny didn't answer. He made a face like he was struggling to find words and turned onto Tremont Avenue, where he nearly ran into the back of a horse-drawn wagon. Sandra asked, Did I do something wrong? She folded her hands in her lap and stared out the front window as if she were afraid to look at Sonny, afraid of what he might say. It's nothing about you, Sonny said. You're beautiful, he added as he slowed the car to a crawl following the junk wagon. I want to do everything right with you, he said, turning to look at her. So it's all special, the way it should be. Oh, Sandra said, the single syllable full of disappointment. When we get married? he said. We can have a honeymoon. We can go someplace like Niagara Falls. He turned to look at her again. We can make it be like it's supposed to when you get married. He was quiet, and then he laughed. What are you laughing at? Me, Sonny said. I think I might be going crazy. Sandra slid close to him again and hooked her arms around his. Have you told your family yet? Not yet. He gave her a quick kiss. I wanted to be sure you'd say yes. You knew I'd say yes, she said. I'm crazy about you. What's this? Sonny had just turned onto Sandra's street, and the first thing he saw was his father's big Essex parked in front of her building. What? Sandra looked to her building and then up to her grandmother's window. That's my father's car, Sonny said. He pulled up to the curb in front of the Essex and hopped out to the street just as Clemenza was stepping out onto the sidewalk followed by Tessio. In the front seat, Richie Gatto lifted his fingers from the steering wheel, acknowledging Sonny. Al Hatz sat alongside him with his arms crossed over his chest, a black Homburg circling his head. What's going on? Sonny asked, his face red. Calm down, Clemenza said, and he clapped a meaty hand around Sonny's forearm. Tessio, standing next to Clemenza, said, Everything's all right, Sonny. Then what are you doing here? You must be Sandra. Clemenza stepped around Sonny and offered Sandra his hand. Sandra hesitated, looked to Sonny, and when he nodded, she took Clemenza's hand. We're going to steal Sonny away from you, Clemenza said. He'll talk to you tomorrow. Que cazzo! Sonny started toward Clemenza and was stopped abruptly when Tessio slapped his arm around his shoulder and pulled him close. Everything's okay, honey. Tessio said to Sandra in his typical monotone, a voice that always sounded like it was in mourning. Santino? Sandra said, frightened, turning Sonny's name into a question. Sonny pulled loose from Tessio. I'll see her to the door, he said to Clemenza. To Sandra, he said, leading her up the stairs. These are close friends of my family. He added, there must be some kind of a problem. I'll tell you as soon as I know. At the door, Sandra asked, is everything all right, though, Sonny? And the words came out more like a plea than a question. Yeah, of course. Sonny kissed her on the cheek. It's something to do with the family business. He opened the door for her. Nothing to worry about. Are you sure? Sandra looked past him to Clemenza and Tessio, where they stood on either side of the big Essex like sentries. Of course I'm sure, Sonny said. He nudged her inside the door. I'll talk to you tomorrow, I promise. 
He closed the door behind her after a quick kiss on the lips and trotted down the steps. When he was in the back seat of the car between Clemenza and Tessio, he looked from one to the other and said calmly, What's going on? Richie started the car, and Al thrust his open hand at Sonny. Tessio said, Give him your car keys. You're coming with us. Sonny looked at Tessio as if he was on the verge of punching him, but he handed Al his keys. Hat said, Me at the offices, and got out of the car. Clemenza said, Mariposa came after me and Jenko tonight. Jenko, Sonny said, his voice suddenly thick with worry. No, Jenko's fine, Clemenza said, and he put a hand on Sonny's shoulder as if to calm him. What happened? Richie made a careful three-point turn and headed back to Hughes Avenue, with Al following in the Packard. Mariposa brought in a couple of torpedoes from Cleveland, Clemenza said, to push me and Jenko, he shrugged. We found out in time. Now they're in the river seeing if they could swim. On Hester Street, Richie Gatto pulled up behind the warehouse, where two of Tessio's men were standing on either side of the entrance to the alley. The weather had turned chilly and damp, and a breeze through the alley fluttered the canvas tarps on a line of delivery trucks. Two shadowy figures stood by the back door to the warehouse, where a cat meowed at their feet, and then stood up on its back legs before one of the figures bent to it and picked it up, silencing it by scratching its neck. In the sky, a sliver of a sickle moon was visible through a break in the clouds. Sonny quickly made his way down the alley. When he neared the back entrance, where Clemenza and Tessio had just disappeared into the warehouse, he saw that the shadowy figures at the door were the Romero twins. They were both wearing trench coats under which Sonny could see the shape of a pair of choppers. Boys, Sonny said, and he stopped to shake hands with them, while Richie Gatto waited behind him. Looks like there's finally going to be some action. Couldn't tell it from around here. Vinny tossed the cat he was holding onto the back of one of the delivery trucks, where it quickly jumped down and disappeared into the shadows. Everything's quiet here, Angelo said, echoing his brother. He adjusted his hat, a brown derby with a small red and white feather in the brim. Sonny snatched the hat off Angelo's head and looked it over, and then, grinning, nodded toward Vinny's black felt fedora. They're making you wear different hats now, he said, to tell you apart, right? Vinny gestured to his brother. He's got to wear that thing with a pretty little feather. Menage la miseria, Angelo said. Makes me look like a mick. Hey, boys, Richie said, and he put a hand on the back of Sonny's arm. We got business to take care of. I'll talk with you later. Sonny reached for the door, but Angelo stepped in front of him and pulled it open first. You guys making good money? Sonny asked with one foot in the doorway and the other in the alley. The twins nodded and Vinny patted Sonny on the shoulder, and then Sonny made his way into the warehouse. There may not be anything going on right now, Richie said to the twins, but that don't mean nothing for five minutes from now. You guys understand what I'm saying? The twins said, yeah, sure. And Richie added, keep your mind on the job. Sonny opened the door to his father's office while Frankie Pentangeli was in the middle of a sentence. Frankie stopped and the room went quiet as everybody turned to Sonny and then Richie Gatto in the doorway. Vito was seated behind his desk, leaning back in his office chair. Tessio and Jenko were seated in front of the desk while Clemenza sat on the big file cabinet and Luca Brasi stood with his back to the wall, his arms crossed over his chest and his eyes vacant, looking at nothing but the space immediately in front of him. Frankie straddled the folding chair beside Tessio and Jenko, his arms crossed over the backrest. Vito gestured for Sonny and Richie to come into the office. To Frankie, he said, You know my son Santino? Sure, Frankie said. He flashed a smile at Vito. Then grow up fast. Vito shrugged as if he wasn't sure about that. Go on, he said. Please. Richie and Sonny found a couple of folding chairs at the back of the room. Richie flipped his open and took a seat close to Clemenza. Sonny carried his chair around to the side of the desk and sat close to his father. Frankie's eyes followed Santino as if he was a little surprised to see the boy position himself so close to the Don. Per favore, Vito said, urging Frankie to continue. Yeah, Frankie said. Like I was saying, Mariposa's going crazy. 
He says he wants his boys to find the bodies of the Anthonys and bring them back to him just so he can piss on them. Too bad, Clemenza said, because he ain't gonna have any luck with that. Buffon me, Jenko said, meaning Giuseppe. But he has friends, Frankie said. I got word he went to Capone, and I'll send in two of his torpedoes to take care of you, Vito. I don't know who they are yet, but that Chicago outfit, they're beasts. Who's that pig Capone sending? Sonny yelled, leaning out of his chair toward Frankie. That fat slob. Sonny pointed at Frankie angrily as if accusing him. How'd you get word? He demanded. Who told you? Sonny, Vito said before Frankie could respond. Go stand outside the door. Make sure nobody comes in. Pop! Sonny was cut off by Clemenza, who jumped up from his seat on the file cabinet, red-faced. Shut up and go stand outside the fucking door like your Don just told you to, Sonny, or I swear to God. He raised his fist and took a step toward the desk. Cazzo! Sonny looked surprised by Clemenza's outburst. Vito said again, still leaning back in his seat. Sonny? Go stand outside the door and make sure nobody comes in. Pop, Sonny said, containing himself. There's nobody out there. When Vito only stared at him, Sonny threw up his hands in frustration and left the room, snapping the door closed behind him. Loudly, so that Sonny had to hear, Vito said, Frankie Pentangeli, please forgive my thick-headed son. He has a good heart, but unfortunately, he's also stupid, and he doesn't listen. Still, he's my son, and so I try to teach him. But I ask you again, please forgive him. I'm sure he'll apologize for... Sp but with Frankie on the inside, Schenko argued to Vito, we can get to Mariposa if that has to be, if that's what we have to do. No, Vito said raising a hand to Jenko, ending the debate. Frankie Pentangeli is a man close to our heart. We won't let him risk his life for us any more than he already has. Frankie said, Thank you, Don Corleone. To Jenko, he added, Don't kid yourself about if that has to be. You're in a war now, and it won't be over until Giuseppe Mariposa is dead. Luca Brazzi, whose vacant stare had seemed to make him disappear, spoke up, startling everyone, seemingly but Vito, who turned his head calmly to Luca, almost as if he'd been expecting him to speak. Don Corleone, Luca said, his voice and manner sounding especially slow-witted. May I suggest that you let me kill Giuseppe Mariposa? Give me the word, and I'll give you my word. Giuseppe Mariposa will be a dead man very soon. The men in the room all watched Luca while he spoke, and then turned to Vito, waiting for his reply. Luca, Vito said, you're too valuable to me now to let you risk your life as I know you would to kill Giuseppe. I have no doubt that you would either kill him or get yourself killed trying, and the time may yet come that I have no choice but to ask you for your services in that regard. He reached into the top drawer of his desk and came back with a cigar. For now, though, he continued, you can serve me best by taking care of these two killers Capone is sending for me. Luca said, That I will be happy to do for you, Don Corleone. He leaned back against the wall again and quickly drifted off into his blank stare. Frankie, Vito asked, will your man be able to help us with this Capone matter? Frankie nodded. If it gets too hot for him, though, we'll need to take him in. He's a good kid, Vito. I wouldn't want to see anything happen to him. Of course, Vito said. You can bring him into your family with our blessing when the time comes. Good. As soon as he finds out something, I'll know about it. Frankie found matches in his jacket pocket and lit the cigar he'd been toying with. What happened tonight at Angelo's? 
Jenko said. Won't look good for Mariposa with the rest of the families. By coming at us so soon after St. Francis, he showed them all that his word is worth nothing. Plus, Tessio said in a voice as lugubrious as always, we outmaneuvered him, which won't look good for Joe either. My guys, Frankie said, cigar in mouth, small as we are, still, they'll know my guys are with you. All this is good, Jenko said, and he raised a hand palm out, as if to slow things down. We've won the first battle, but Mariposa remains much stronger than we are. Still, Vito said, we have our advantages. He looked at the cigar he'd been holding and then placed it on the desk. Giuseppe is stupid. But his capo regimes aren't, Clemenza interrupted. See, si, Vito said. But Giuseppe calls the shots. He rolled the cigar across the desk as if flipping aside Clemenza's objection. But Tessio's regime in reserve, he went on, was stronger than Giuseppe realizes. And we have more cops, judges, and politicians in our pocket than he dreams. He touched the rim of an empty glass on his desk and then tapped it twice, as if calling the room to attention. Most important of all, he said, we have the respect of the other families, which Giuseppe does not. He looked over the men gathered around him. The families know they can deal with us, he said, tapping the glass again because our word is good. Mark what I say, he added. If we show enough strength in this war, the other families will come around to our side. I agree with Vito, Jenko said, looking at Vito but speaking to the others. I think we can win. Vito was quiet as he waited for any possible objections from Tessio or Clemenza. When neither man spoke, it was as if a vote had been taken and a decision to aggressively pursue a war with Giuseppe Mariposa had been reached. Luca will be my bodyguard, Vito said, moving on to details. When he's busy with us... First, Jenko said. He shifted his chair closer to the desk and turned it around so that he was facing everyone. First, he repeated. We needed to take care of Capone's torpedoes. Then, he said and he touched the tip of his nose before he spoke as if he was trying to make a final decision about something. Frankie's right about this. We have to take care of Mariposa. He shrugged as if having to bump off Mariposa was a problem but necessary. If we can do those two things soon as possible, he added, maybe the rest of the families will come around to join us. They won't be happy with Mariposa for going to Capone, Clemenza said, shifting his weight on the file cabinet. Calling in a Neapolitan against a Sicilian? He waved his finger. They won't like that. Luca, Jenko said. We'll leave Capone's men to you. Frankie, he went on. You give Luca everything you know. He folded his arms over his chest as he sat back in his chair. Let me say again, even though we're outmanned, I think our chances are good. For now, though, and until things settle, we stay out of sight. I've already had some of our boys fix up rooms at the compound on Long Island. The houses aren't finished, the wall isn't completed, but it's close. For right now, we, all of us, and all of our key men, will be living at the compound. Richie Gatto, who usually knew better than to speak at a meeting like this, said, Right now? My wife needs... He sounded as if he was about to explain the difficulty of having to go immediately to the compound before he caught himself. Richie! Clemenza said. What your wife doesn't need is to be a widow, am I right? Vito got up from his desk seat and approached Richie. I have complete faith in Genko Abandando, he said to everyone. He's a Sicilian. And who's better than a Sicilian as a wartime conciliary? Vito put an arm around Richie's shoulder. Your wife and children will be taken care of, he said and he gave Richie an affectionate squeeze as he led him to the door. Your wife, Ursula, your son, Paulie, will take care of them as if they were our own blood. On this, Richie, you have our word. Thank you, Don Corleone, 
Richie glanced at Clemenza. Go get the rest of the boys, Clemenza said to Richie. And then he stood and joined Luca and the others as they filed out of the office. At the door, Clemenza embraced Vito, as had Tessio and Frankie before him. Jenko watched as Clemenza closed the door. Vito, he asked, what should we do about the parade? Ah, uh, Vito said and tapped his forehead with a fingertip as if jogging loose the details of the parade. Councilman Fisher, he said. See, si. when Vito nodded in agreement, Jenko embraced him and then left the office. Once Jenko disappeared among the crates and shadows of the warehouse, Sonny stepped into the office and closed the door. Pop, he said. I need to talk to you for a minute. Vito fell back into his office chair and looked up at Sonny. What's wrong with you? He asked. You talk to a man of honor like Pentangeli as if he's a nobody. You'll raise your voice and point your finger at such a man. I'm sorry, Pop. I lost my temper. You lost your temper. Vito repeated. He sighed and turned away from Sonny. He looked out over the office at the empty folding chairs and bare walls. Somewhere outside, a truck rumbled by, the groan of its engine audible over the background murmur of traffic. In the warehouse, doors opened and closed, and the sound of voices and quick conversations floated in the air, muted and cryptic. Vito touched the knot of his tie and then loosened it a little. When he turned back to Sonny, he said, You want to be in your father's business? Now you're in it. He raised a finger in emphasis, signaling Sonny to pay attention. You're not to say another word in one of our meetings until I tell you otherwise, or unless I ask you to speak. Do you understand? Jesus, Pop! Fido jumped up from his seat and grasped Sonny by the collar. Don't argue with me. I asked you, do you understand? Jesus, yeah, sure. I understand. Sonny stepped back out of his father's grasp and straightened out his shirt. Go on, Vito said, and he pointed to the door. Go. Sonny hesitated, then went to the door and grasped the knob before he turned around again to find Vito glaring at him. Pop, he said, as if nothing had happened, as if in the time it took him to turn away from Vito and then back to face him, he had forgotten his father's anger. I wanted to tell you, he said. I've asked Sandra to marry me. In the long silence that followed Sonny's announcement, Vito continued to stare at him, the glare slowly dissipating to be replaced by a look that was more curious than angry. Finally, he said, So now you'll have a wife to care for, and soon after, children. Though he was addressing Sonny, Vito sounded like he was talking to himself. Maybe a wife will teach you to listen, he said. Maybe children will teach you patience. Who knows, Sonny said and laughed. I guess anything's possible. Vito looked Sonny over. Come here, he said, and he opened his arms to him. Sonny embraced his father and then stepped back. I'm still young, he said excusing himself for everything about him that angered Vito. But I can learn, Pop. I can learn from you. And now that I'm getting married, I have my own family. Vito grasped Sonny by the back of the head, taking a handful of his thick hair in his hand. A wall like this, he said, is what I wanted to protect you from. He watched Sonny's eyes and then pulled him close and kissed his forehead. But at that I failed, he said, and then 